Okay, welcome back to the KingCast. Great to have you with us this week. As always, the KingCast presented by the Economics Division of the Social Sciences Department. I'm your host, Frank Roach. With me today, as always, Nicole Ward. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Mr. Resch. Mr. Murphy. Jake, how are you today, sir? Good morning. I'm very good. Good. And the guest host this week from the ninth grade, class of 2024, Josh Bershon. Josh, how are you today? Good. How are you? Good to see you outside of study hall. And uh, Josh has been helping us with the weekly market report and the monthly economic report. Always happy to have a new face on the KingCast. As always, we're excited to be back and we hope you enjoy the KingCast. A lot of stuff to talk about. We got a lot of nice feedback from last week's interview with, with Mr. Dean Maki from Point72 Asset Management. I thought that went great. A great show overall. One of our best shows I thought of the season. Um, there's a lot to talk about today, right? Nicole's going to focus on uh, earnings this week. Nicole's our, our, our finance guru the past couple of weeks. But beyond that, right, we have, uh, we have Russia and Ukraine, we have China and Taiwan, we have concerns about COVID mutations, we have massive deficit spending, the Federal Reserve with zero interest rates, rising income gaps, hot housing markets, a populace ready to come out of lockdown and spend some money. So a lot of countervailing forces out there. We're trying to stay on top of everything and we'll do the best we can for you as well today. Nicole, I love earnings season. It can be market moving. And uh, of course, investors love it as well. This can be a very detailed focus, right? So this is usually every quarter we get the, when the next quarter begins, we get the earnings from the prior quarter. Sometimes remarkable how much people, how much companies make in a given quarter. Nicole, what's going on with bank earnings or forget that earnings generally. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Roche. So last week I assessed whether the stock market is overvalued given the continued elevation of stock prices. And concluding that the market may not be overvalued, one of the things I noted is that the price to earnings ratios may be overstated because they're not reflecting the true expected earnings for 2021, which may be much higher. The earnings reported this past week by the big banks supports my thesis. For many big banks, earnings were well above expectations and the outperformance was across the board. Take Goldman Sachs, for example. The expected earnings for the first quarter before they reported results was $10.22 per share. If you annualize that by multiplying that number by four for four quarters, the annualized expected earnings for Goldman for 2021 is $40.88. Goldman was trading at $328 per share before the quarterly results were released, so the PE for Goldman was eight times, $328 over $40.88. Recall that a PE ratio of eight times means it would take an investor eight years to earn back their purchase of the stock based on the company's earnings. Now, if you annualize the actual earnings reported for the quarter of $18.60 per share, the P.E. ratio at $328 per share is only 4.4 times. So the valuation based on reported earnings was much lower. At these higher earnings, it would take you less than five years to earn back your investment in the shares. As a result, the stock price went up from $328 to $340, or up about 4% this week. For simplicity, I annualized the first quarter results for the per earnings in the P.E. ratio. But a key question is whether we should expect similar results for the remaining three quarters of 2021. The answer to this question may be different depending on the bank. For Goldman, the outperformance came from increased trading activity and investment banking. These segments can be more volatile than other segments because it depends on corporate activity during the quarter. And once a company raises capital, they generally don't go back to the market for some period of time. With equity markets near all-time highs and interest rates near all-time lows, companies were incentivized to raise capital at attractive levels, which contributed to the robust capital markets activity. With the recent increase in rates that we previously discussed, some of that capital markets activity may slow down. So maybe Goldman will not have the same level of activity going forward as this past quarter. Nevertheless, as long as the economy keeps humming along, Goldman will likely continue to report strong results for the rest of the year. Commercial banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citi, and Wells Fargo also reported strong results. They also benefited from strong trading and capital markets activity. Another key source of outperformance was the release of loan loss reserves. Loan loss reserves are when the bank puts money aside for expected losses from defaults on their existing loans that are outstanding. At the beginning of the pandemic, banks significantly increased their loan loss reserves. And now with the picture for the economy significantly improving, banks are benefiting from releasing those reserves. But those are one-time benefits and are not expected for future quarters. Also, keep in mind that commercial banks are much more focused on loan activity and interest margins, which is lending revenue minus borrowing costs. Loan growth continues to be weaker, particularly with small companies still being impacted by the pandemic. Nevertheless, as recovery continues to accelerate, I would expect loan activity will start to grow strongly. Also, with the yield curve steepening, the banks should be able to borrow at lower short-term rates and lend at higher long-term rates, 
thereby increasing their interest margins. So it would appear there is a strong environment coming for commercial banks. I think James Kramer is right on the money when he says, after these numbers, the banks have gotten dirt cheap. Financials seem like a good place to be invested as the roaring 2020s continues to pick up steam. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comparison to the roaring 2020s. So watch out that what happened in, in the 1930s, not a good outcome. Uh, Nicole, great insights as always. Really intrigued by Goldman's uh, quarterly statement. Holy cow, they made a fortune. Uh, trading investment banking across the board, they did really well. Nicole, you might have a seat at one of their desks with that great report, by the way. You should send this to Goldman, make sure they have some insight on how you analyze their, their outlook. So well done there. And of course, uh, net interest earnings for banks is critical. And so as the yield curve steepens, just as you said, Nicole, right, they, they borrow short and they lend long. And so as that, as that spread widens, it, it's helpful for the banking sector in terms of profitability. Now, of course, Goldman is, is a wonderful example of success in the, in the quarter. Other banks that caught up in the, uh, and Jake, you can relate to this from last week, and the Arch Eagles uh, disaster are getting hammered. I saw Morgan Stanley uh, having almost lost a billion dollars in the quarter. So really interesting uh, comparisons there. Nicole, how has the mindset of investors changed after these stellar earnings were reported last week with respect to Goldman? So going into earnings, there was concern that bank valuations were getting ahead of themselves as they've doubled since the onset of the pandemic and up about 50% since before the pandemic. But after these reports, I think investors understand that these are good times for the financials and there looks to be significant runway ahead from the banks to continue to perform well. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. And of course, Goldman's always a leader. They're best in class. So not too surprising there. All right, that's an outstanding report, Nicole. Thank you so much. Let's move on to our, our new co-host this week, Josh Gershon. Josh, you took a look at the very popular IPO this week, Coinbase. Uh, this is the crypto world. Josh, went on with the IPO for Coinbase this week? This week on Wednesday, the tech company Coinbase Global went public on the NASDAQ and lived up to the hype. Shares of the cryptocurrency exchange rose nearly 32% Wednesday, valuing Coinbase at nearly an $86 billion valuation. Coinbase stock opened at $381 a share, peaked at $429 a share, and then dropped. Shares closed at $328 up $78 from Coinbase's original reference point. NASDAQ issued the $250 reference point on Tuesday. With 261 million diluted shares outstanding, Coinbase now has a market capitalization of about 86 billion. This is bigger than much older exchanges like the Intercontinental Exchange, parent of the New York Stock Exchange, which has a $67 billion market cap or the NASDAQ, which has a $26 billion market cap. Wow, that is, those are some stunning numbers, Josh. Um, a little jealous to hear these numbers, by the way. Yeah. And obviously, a lot of demand there for that for that um, that ticker price. 250 to 328, way to go. So a lot, of, a lot of the original investors, right? So the IPO is an opportunity for the original investors to cash out in some respects. Some have lockup periods that go a little bit longer, but um, uh, great for the original investors here. Hey, Josh, a, a couple questions. Um, what is the ticker for Coinbase? It's Coin. Coin, C-O-I-N? Okay, yep. good. And Josh, uh, what do you know about this founder, this young man who's done this, who's become an overnight billionaire? Uh, what was his original experience? And do you know where he first bought Bitcoin? Yeah, Brian Armstrong, he was, he was an original employee at Airbnb, and he first bought Bitcoin at $6. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, had an idea, took some risk, and holy cow. We are creating billionaires and hundred millionaires like crazy in America right now. Uh, and yeah. it's mostly in finance, isn't it? The IPOs and stuff like that. All right, Josh, great report. As always, thank you so much. Well, not as always, because it's your first time, but great okay. first report, Josh. I look forward to having the show again and learn more insights about that kind of thing. All right, now it's the time of the show we go to. What did we learn this week? Uh, you know, I love this segment. Always fun for me. What did I learn this week? I learned that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to be even more of a challenge for all the NFL teams in the coming season as they added Giovanni Bernard to the backfield to help Tom Brady even more. Really great get. Uh, I am a Patriots fan. But I'm a bigger Tom Brady's fan. So rah, 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 Tampa Bay going for another Super Bowl. What did you learn this week, Jake? Um, well, this week I went into some pretty crazy stuff in calculus. We learned anti-derivatives, which is some whack stuff. It's actually... Uh, a big coincidence because just uh, last week I was at my friend KJ's house and he was in the middle of one of his classes at USC on Zoom and he was doing the same thing. And so I was like, oh, 
uh, I actually know all about this stuff. It was much harder than I anticipated, though. Really crazy stuff. Now we're basically doing the exact opposite of what we did before, which is just normal derivatives. You're working backwards. It's crazy. really weird, but it's uh, fun. Jake, who's the teacher? Uh, that would be um, Mr. Oh, sorry, I'll cut that. I don't know why. No, oh, no, no, you can't cut blank. that out. No, that stays in and this stays in too. This no. Is no. Yes. Who's your <laughs> no. Cut that out, Jake Murphy. Who's your teacher? I don't know why I'm <laughs> blank because I was just t- oh, Mr. Salson. Oh, <laughs> uh, that was great. He would love that. Brian, Brian will be will enjoy that. Mr. Salson they, is like my I favorite want to teacher. encourage him not to cut this out. He's a great guy. He will not be a health problem with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, right. Jay, KJ is that KJ Gallagher? Yeah, yeah. Oh, in a, in a finance and trading guru as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell him we said hi because he was on the KingCast before he left school last year. All right, Nicole, what you learned this week? So as a tennis player, I've constantly been told to follow through when hitting the ball. And this past week, I was actually able to learn the physics behind that in my physics class with Mr. Hyatt. So follow through increases the time of collision between the racket and the tennis ball. And the formula for change in momentum is force times the time of collision. So if you increase the contact time, you actually increase the change in momentum. See, now uh, that's really interesting. I've always thought about this. Anyone that's ever golf thinks about this, right? Because they talk about the imp- importance of the full follow through. And I've always wondered, why do I have to bring my club all the way back behind my head? I hit the ball like a half a second ago and the ball is gone. And there we go. We got some explanation about that. What did we learn this week? All right, Josh, what'd you learn this week? So I actually learned about the biology of race in biology class and how, you know, we, we learned about inherited traits and how they can be pretty similar across all races. Okay, who's the teacher? Uh, Mr. Brock. Mr. Brock, okay. In what class? In, in biology. Oh, oh, right, you mentioned that, of course. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I guess I should pay attention. All right, Josh, not bad for your first week of, of what we learned this week. Uh, and that is... What, what did, did we, we learn, learn this week? week? All right, I'll say it one more time because I say it every show. I love that stuff. always makes you smile. I got my sisters to watch the KingCast last week because of that interview, and they really enjoyed the What Did We Learn This Week segment. All right, that is it for us. Now it's time to talk about a great King community. What's going on with King things, Nicole and Jake? So King School is delighted to welcome Dr. Clyde Beverly III as the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, starting on July 1st. Congratulations to King Aspire students, Billy Burnfield, Jacob Boyar, Sammy Hillenmeyer, and Wafa Nomani, who all qualified for the finals round of the 2021 Connecticut Science and Engineering Fair. Okay, it's a little bit of a quiet time here at King with respect to activities because of COVID and lockdowns and all that stuff. So we don't have a lot of King things these days. But sports is back, right? Spring sports, uh, we record on Saturdays. Again, we're not trying to hide the, what we're doing here. So we record Saturdays, we publish on Mondays. And on Saturday, the, the King teams are away. I think they're at Greenwich Country Day this week uh, for a bunch of sporting events. And then we'll be back on campus this week, this coming Saturday, the 24th of Saturday. Um, and King Sports will be back on the King Field. So really kind of fun to see everyone back on the, on the fields. And now, Nicole, what do you have for sports, Nicole? You, you, you liked, we, we got a lot of nice feedback from the sports report last week. So you're back here again. Talk to us. So for some NBA news this week, first, Dwayne Wade purchased an ownership stake in the Utah Jazz. He joins a list of former NBA players who are now team owners, including Michael Jordan and the Hornets, Grant Hill and the Hawks, Shaq and the Kings, and Renee Montgomery and the Dream in the WNBA. In Los Angeles, Anthony Davis left the Lakers lineup about two months ago with a calf strain in his right leg. LeBron has also been out with a right ankle sprain. Nevertheless, the team has been able to hold on with a record above 500 on a recent road trip. The Lakers got some good news this week with Davis being cleared for full contact practice and his return to the game action is imminent. Likewise, LeBron is expected to be back soon. We've seen this movie before with LeBron and AD getting some rest with injuries, but getting back to full strength as the playoffs approach. Staying on the West Coast, Steph Curry has been red hot and the Golden State Warriors have been on a winning streak that could put a playoff appearance within reach. They have won their last four games and are in ninth place in the West. This past week, Steph scored 53 points in their win against the Nuggets on Monday, 42 points in their win against the Thunder on Wednesday, and 33 in their win against the Cavs on Thursday. The Warriors take on the Celtics tonight, and I'm sure Steph will be ready. Lastly, I just wanted to quickly address the play-in tournament for the NBA playoffs that has become quite controversial. Before the NBA adopted the play-in tournament, the top eight seeds in the East and West Conference would make the playoffs when the regular season ended. Now, with the play-in tournament, only the top six teams in each conference are guaranteed to be in the playoffs. 
the teams that finish seventh and eighth will join the teams that finished ninth and 10th in a four team play in tournament to determine the final two playoff spots. Here's how the play in tournament format works. The seventh place team will host the eighth place team in a one game matchup. The winner of that game will earn the number seventh seed in the playoffs. The ninth place team will host the 10th place team in a one game matchup. The loser of that game is eliminated. The loser of the seventh first eighth place game will host the winner of the ninth first 10th place game in a one game matchup. The winner of that game will own the number eight seed in the playoffs and the loser of that game will be eliminated. From that point, the playoffs will proceed as usual. It's controversial because many are saying that the seventh and eighth seeds please played a whole season to get there. And why should they now be in jeopardy of losing their spot in the playoffs because they lost a couple games in the play-in tournament? I guess we'll see how it works this year, but this format may not be around long. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that because I would have been confused about that one. Um, I, it sounds kind of cool, but I can appreciate the angst of the seventh and eighth place teams there for sure. Um, all right, I haven't watched the NBA for a while. Perhaps this might get me back just to see how that works out. All right, thank you. And that is sports. Great job by Jack, Rahill, and Nicole. We miss Lily. Lily would have done some NHL for us today, right, Nicole? Definitely. Yeah, I think the Rangers did well and the Bruins are doing well, and she would have lots of great names to say as well. All right. Thank you so much. Now it's time for economy and markets. This is, of course, after my, well, what did we learn this week? This is my favorite thing because I'm an econ junkie. We talk about the importance of uh, investing, saving, understanding the world around you comes through the information received from economic data and financial market reactions, economic data, public policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy. This is what we try to cover when we talk about data and markets. Uh, Jake, you have a hot topic to for us with respect to Bitcoin, if I'm not mistaken. Why don't you start us off? Well, actually, I don't know if I have a hot topic anymore because Josh and I actually covered the same thing. Oh, okay. There's a big IPO that happened. All right. So you were going to talk about Coinbase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have a few other points if I could yeah, say sure. them anyway. Yeah. yeah. So everyone knows Coinbase finally went public earlier this week, closing at 328 bucks a share after fetching a valuation of $85.8 billion. But the story not only marks an interesting economic tale, but also a greater lesson to be learned about cryptocurrencies going mainstream. So Coinbase was founded back in 2012, the hope of making it easier and simpler to purchase, hold, and sell crypto. Less than a decade later, and it's now the most popular crypto exchange in the U.S., and its founders are billionaires. The service now holds 56 million users, up from 43 million at the end of 2020 and 32 million the year before that. In its last private financing round in 2018, investors valued Coinbase at only $8 billion. Now, the frenzy around Coinbase as well as cryptocurrency in general has caused some pretty scary and unexpected things to happen in the investment world. ARK Investment purchased another $64 million in Coinbase shares just yesterday and sold almost $100 million of Tesla shares. So many other investment management firms have started selling off dictionary stocks in the hopes to fund massive buy-ins of Coinbase and basically anything crypto. A lot of frenzy around crypto now. Incredible. Now, again, um, <laughs> I have trouble with crypto because it's only value comes from scarcity. And the only reason people are buying it is because more people buy it, the higher the value goes and people that have it make more money. A little frustrating insofar as I don't own them. Um, but great news for everyone. Listen, this is wealth that should trickle down to the economy, whether it's wealth created that, that has lasting impacts for our long-term economic growth, well, that remains to be seen. But it's growing hot. Crypto just can't be ignored anymore. All right, great story. Nice tying with Josh from our Hot Topics to start the show. So good work there, both of you. All right, let's talk about data for the week ending April 9th. Nicole, start us off. So for Friday, March housing starts 1.739 million units on an annualized basis versus 1.72 million on, in February. And April, U Michigan consumer sentiment 86.5 versus 84.9 in March. For Thursday, initial unemployment claims, week ending April 10th, 576,000 versus 769,000 in prior week. April New York Empire Manufacturing Index, 26.30 versus 17.40 in March. April Philadelphia Fed Index, 66.6 versus 61.6 in March. March retail sales up 9.8% versus down 2.7% in February. March industrial production up 1.4% versus down 2.6% in February. And capacity utilization 74.4% versus 73.4% in February. In February, Treasury national, international capital flows 72.6 billion versus 105.8 billion in January. That was a mouthful, Jake. Well done. Josh. Wednesday, MBA mortgage applications week ending April 9th, minus 3.7% versus minus 5.1% in the prior week. 
Tuesday, March Consumer Price Index up 0.6% versus up 0.4% in February. For Monday, March federal budget balance minus 660 billion versus minus 311 billion in February. Okay, right now we should all join in song. Happy days are here again. Clapping our hands. God bless America. Can't keep a good country down. Holy cow, what a month in March for economic outbreak, right? So coming out of lockdowns, pent up demand, Federal Reserve injecting huge amounts of money, huge amounts of fiscal stimulus as well. And things are looking good. Claims with a five handle on it for the first time since March of last year. Uh, really good news there, although continuing claims remain elevated. Our, our indexes for manufacturing are higher. Confidence is high with March uh, U Michigan consumer sentiment. Production is up. Capacity utilization is up. Of course, we have a really scary number right in the $660 billion um, one month deficit from the federal government. That, that connects to that huge retail sale number up 9.8% historic rise in retail sales. Stimmy checks, huge injection of cash. Not sustainable, mind you. But it does tie in with Mr. Mocky's predictions from last week. We're going to get a nice, robust GDP print in the first and second quarter here in 2021. All right. Now let's talk about data for this week. Uh, Jake, start us off. For Monday, no data. Tuesday, no data. For Wednesday, MBA mortgage applications week ending April 16th. Thursday, initial unemployment claims week ending April 17th. March existing home sales. Friday, March, new home sales. Okay, and so that's data and the economy force. Watch that carefully. It'll help you become a better investor. Help you trade Bitcoin as well. And now let's check on markets for the week ending 416. Can't keep good markets down. Josh, start us off with equities. S&P 500, 4,185, up 57 points. NASDAQ, 14,051.79, up 152 points. Three-month treasury, 0.02%, up half basis point. 10-year Treasury, 1.576%, down 8.6 basis points. 30-year Treasury, 2.262%, down 7.4 basis points. Euro dollar, 119.80, up 80 pips. Dollar yen, 108.78, up 87 pips. Sterling, 1.383, up 120 pips. Dollar CAD, 1.2510, down 10 pips. Oil, West Texas Intermediate, out of our great state of Texas, $63.11, up $3.77. Brent, $66.73, up 3.78. Gasoline, $2.41, up $0.08. Cents. Gold, $1,778.50, up 34.50. All right, quick review of markets there. Higher stocks can't keep the good stock market down. Uh, lower interest rates on the long end, not much change on the short end, so a little flatter yield curve. Higher energy prices on pent up demand, higher gold about concerns about inflation, even though uh, cryptocurrency is taking over gold for a hedge against inflation. Gold still is that. As inflation rears its head, gold is going to go big. Um, so pay attention to that important connection point between inflation and commodity prices. That catches up with everything else. Time for our friendly reminders. Josh, start us off. Do your reading. Do your homework. Come to class prepared. Use your blinker when making turns or switching lanes. Stop signs mean stop. No texting while driving. That is it for us. Thank you to our co host class of 2024, Josh Gershon. Nice job here, Josh. We miss Lily. She will be back with us next week. As always, I thank Nicole Rohr and Jake Murphy. Great job as always. Tell your friends and family to listen to the KingCast at kingschoolct.org campus site page. That is it for us. We are out of here. Enjoy the weekend.